Hope you are all well, witches. On today's episode, we are going to be looking at the cottage witch and a look at the rose and mugwort. Bit of a different episode for you today. I will explain all shortly. To kick things off today, we have our book review. I feel as though I've been so blessed on the good book front of late. Our book today, I must disclose, was sent to me by the publishers for the book. And at times, I think I can be more critical of books when they are sent in to me, just so I'm sure they really are ones I can recommend, not just because I had them sent to me, if that makes sense. Our book for today is Letting Magic In, A Memoir of Becoming Maya Toll. Here is the book's blurb. For writer Maya Toll, magic points to something intrinsic to and necessary for the wholeness of the human spirit. In Letting Magic In, Maya shares the tale of her magical journey from the untimely death of a friend that led her to abandon Brooklyn to the small town of Beacon and finally to Ireland where she studied under a herbalist and learned the true magic of listening to the earth itself. This book is the story of one woman's becoming, the story of pushing past the boundaries of what once seemed possible to discover the extraordinary all around us. Maya shares how she learned to let magic in so she could live the life she longed for. One filled with curiosity, connection and the deepest kind of inner knowing. In this soulfully written recollection, peppered throughout with magical learnings and rituals gathered along the way, Maya uncovers the things that change you in unexpected ways and guide you to become the person you never knew you wanted to be, but perhaps always were. Firstly, when I was contacted by the publishers, I had to not squeal a little because I already love Maya Toll's work. You may be familiar with her from her book, The Night School. If you loved The Wheel by Jennifer Lane, I think you might love this book too. It is so beautifully written. The descriptions were so rich. I felt I was there. The end sections of the book around her time at Samhain were so delicious. The next day I was there on Google to see if I could bugger off to Ireland and be a herbalist's apprentice. So if there's any herbalists in Ireland listening to the podcast and you need a lackey that you can throw the odd bit of herbal knowledge to, I am your gal, honestly. I cannot put this book down. I inhaled it in two days. Firstly, let me say this book is real. It's not eat, pray, love kind of romanticism regarding life, although that is a book that I did enjoy. It is real. There were lots of difficult to navigate topics within the book, especially around the topic of grief. This book deeply moved and inspired me, especially regarding my craft. I loved hearing about different experiences Maya had in relation to her own. And in a sense, I guess the journey to fully identifying unapologetically as a witch and who she truly is. I loved reading about her tarot reading on her birthday, how that played out in the year to follow, and of course, the many different practices and rituals she tried, people that she met along the way. I've always loved a spiritual type memoir. There's nothing better than having a glimpse into someone's life. I think that's what I loved about this book, reading someone's inner thoughts and realizing that we are all more similar than we think. 
particularly loved the section about the old Victorian house that she bought, how she had to explain to people when she was describing it that no, it's not like the house on Practical Magic. I really feel like I have this strange experience of peeking in on Maya's life from reading this book that now we are besties which sounds awfully stalkerish but it is how I feel after enjoying this book. Honest, heartfelt, emotional, witchy as hell. I haven't even talked to you about how the book looks. It is stunning. A gorgeous hardback book with beautiful illustrations on the cover. There are a number of the animals, flowers and fauna that are symbolic in her journey. Talking of books, I just want to let you know I'm having a little summer sale over on my Etsy store. So if you would like to order any of my hedge witches ins, you can use the discount code so moat it be no spaces in between. This will give you 10% off your entire order. There will be a link in the show notes to access that discount code. There is no end date on this offer currently. So if you are listening to this episode down the line, it should still be available to you lovely listeners. Find me at The White Witch Company on Etsy. But again, I'll stick a link in the show notes. The Hedge Witch's Half is one of the zins that covers the two upcoming Sabbaths, Lamas and Mabon. But each Sabbath in the Wheel of the Year is covered throughout them all. So just to leave you with a quote from Maya Toll's book that seamlessly takes us into the Cottage Witch section of the podcast. So recently I have been dabbling with creative writing, focusing on a little witch character called Primrose Hill, an ode to London right there. It might be that I bring her onto the podcast every now and again, or do something entirely different with this little witch, we will see. Simply put, we have a little bit of a story that leads us into our look at Hedge Witchcraft today, where we will be talking about Rose and Mugwort, specifically how you can use them within your craft and also their shared association with spirit work. This theme might not be for you all, but I do love to switch things up and try different things. She is also a character that keeps hassling me to do something with her. So let's see how we get on. This is the quote from Maya Toll's book. Time upon time upon time, there was and is and will be a witch. The witch lives in the depths of the dark forest The witch lives in a cottage by the sea. The witch lives deep within our psyches where she quietly goes about the work of the cycles and the seasons, teaching us over and over again the joy of letting magic in. Join me after the break to meet Primrose Hill, the cottage witch. The clanging sound came from Primrose's metal alarm clock at four in the morning. Primrose begrudgingly opened her eyes a fraction, stretched out her arm, in the process almost knocking everything off her nightstand before managing to halt the shrill siren. A thought crossed her mind in her bleary-eyed, confused state. Why in the goddess have I set an alarm for 4am, she pondered, before the vague recollection surfaced as to what today was, summer solstice, a day she had been preparing for for the last three days. Balthazar, her black cat, stretched out his front paws whilst emanating a large yawn also seemingly baffled as to why they were awake at this ungodly hour. Managing to leap up onto his four paws as Primrose threw back the eider down, hurling herself out of her cosy bed, 
sinking her feet into pink fluffy slippers, pouring her arms into a fluffy peach coloured dressing gown before making her way to the kitchen. Pots and pans were stacked up in the white butler's sink. She considered how the house spirit wouldn't be best pleased with her for leaving those. She hadn't time to fuss about that now and vowed she would make it up to him later by washing them all with hot soapy lemony water to give them all a good scrub before putting them away, making sure she left the house spirit a generous offering from her litha baking. Primrose took out her wicker picnic basket, lined with a peach gingham fabric, and began to empty out the contents of her cupboards of all she had prepared for today. A peach cobbler, lemon and lavender cake, and a bottle of her homemade lemonade. She added to the basket napkins, some cutlery, and contemplated which crockery to bring before finally deciding Today was as good a day as any to take with her some of her late grandma's fine china, the set that had the sunflowers adorning them. Primrose then proceeded to put together the contents for her sun tea into a large mason jar. To make Primrose's sun tea, you will need a quarter sized mason jar, four or five fresh mint leaves, a green tea bag, a tablespoon of rose syrup, one tablespoon of sugar and filtered water to fill your jar. Simply place all the ingredients into your jar, fill your jar with the water, then place your jar in a sunny spot covered by a lid or piece of cheesecloth secured with a rubber band. Let your sun tea infuse in the sunshine for around three hours. Primrose leaves hers upon the sunny kitchen windowsill to enjoy upon her return. Primrose added the honey bread to the basket that she had baked late last night. She wrapped some butter in white greaseproof paper that she tied into a square shape with twine, complemented with a jar of the lemon curd she had purchased just last Wednesday from Mr. Copperworth's store in the town. No matter how hard she tried, she could never top his recipe, so she no longer bothered. Food all packed up, Primrose sprinted up the stairs to her altar that she had freshly cleaned yesterday using her magical cleaning wash. This she made up with some close to hot water, freshly cut lemons, which she had in ample supply for her lemon and lavender cake and lemonade. Lemon resonates with both the sun and moon's energy. It brings happiness and joy and it's perfect for cleansing and protection. So Primrose likes to use it in an abundance when she cleans the cottage. She threw in for good measure a handful of her homegrown garden mint growing in a pot by her kitchen door. Primrose grows it in pots as it can take over the garden in a wild fashion a mistake she made in her first year at Moon Willow Cottage when she was awash with the herb. Min also brings to you the element of happiness, but also luck and prosperity. To top it all, lemon and mint together smells heavenly. Primrose had decorated her altar, especially for litha. She likes to change it for each turn of the wheel of the year, using mainly what she can find in nature. This year, Primrose decorated with a water painting her friend Holly gave her last liver of a sunflower. Some dried orange and lemon slices threaded on twine hanging along the wall. Some fresh yellow roses in a vase cut from her garden. Her tiger's eye and carnelian crystals sit atop her altar, along with a sunshine brooch that belonged to her grandma. It's just the dawn of the day and yet Primrose is looking forward to leaving some offerings of herbs and food to the goddess later on. For now though, she grabs her grimoire. Time is ticking and she needs to get on. She rushes down the stairs with these in hand, almost tripping over Balthazar at the kitchen's doorway. 
packs up the last of her paraphernalia in her picnic basket before securing it shut. She removed her dressing gown, stuff and bother with clothes. She will head off in her white cotton nightdress. It's perfectly acceptable attire and likely no one will be out anyway at this ridiculous hour. She peeped through the kitchen's latticed window, the pink and orange fiery sun beginning to rise across the horizon. Quickly, Primrose put her light, long, black witchy coat on, flings her fluffy slippers off, one nearly hitting Balthazar on his noggin, before she put on her long boot socks and her black, heavy bother boots. Primrose grabs the picnic basket, heaves open the huge oak kitchen door and steps out into her kitchen garden. Trailing hurriedly down the path now, Balthazar hurrying to keep up with Primrose, who takes off like a wild banshee down the higgledy-piggledy path, swinging open wildly the white picket fence of her garden's perimeter. Letting it go as it almost strikes Balthazar, who hasn't quite understood the urgency and haste that she is in. She shouts back to him, sorry Balthazar, as she runs along, the picnic basket swinging wildly in her hands, matching the furious motion of the two plaits in her long chestnut brown hair. Primrose dashes across the field, the liminal space between her garden and the forest, until she reaches the darkness of the tall trees. The mossy scent reaches her nose along with the sounds of birds chittering and the skittering and scrambling of squirrels and other woodland creatures. The sun's still not risen, but it's not far off, so she quickly makes her way along the beaten track between the trees, further and further until the trees feel thick and dense around her. Eventually, some light splinters through the branches above and the path begins to open up to the clearing she was so familiar with, where the stone circle she found some Samhain's back was located. You could stand in the stone circle, spread your arms wide, and that is its full entirety. Primrose sets down her picnic basket, takes out her fluffy yellow blanket, spreading it out upon the grass centre of the stone circle and plonks herself down upon it. Just in time for her to begin to see the orangey fiery sun begin to surface along the horizon between the trees, trunks, ferns and bracken. She fumbles inside the basket for some of the honey bread poking her tongue out the side of her mouth in concentration once she locates a butter knife and lemon curd, spreading it generously. Washing it down with lemonade, probably not the best to have for her breakfast, but indeed, who is here to judge? After wiping her hands off on a cream linen napkin, delicately embroidered with a bumblebee, she takes out her grimoire from the picnic basket and flicks through her grandmother's entries. Primrose inherited this upon her grandmother's passing. It had become her most cherished possession. Fit to burst with her grandma's curly writing and some pencil illustrations she had peppered throughout. She flicks through the cumbersome book to see the plants her grandmother had been working with for this particular time of year. She was curious to see her grandmother had noted they were ideal for spirit work amongst their many other uses. Her grandmother had comforted her about spirit. She taught her that spirit could come in many forms, perhaps as a deceased loved one, a god or goddess, the spirit of nature itself, or even the fairy folk. It could be all of them. Primrose mostly liked to think it was her grandmother and the witches that came before her. Focusing back on the grimoire's pages, she had long ago been advised to collect any flowers or fauna she might use within her craft at first dawn when they would be covered with the morning dew, much like the cunning folk of old did. She would either find these within the woods or her tiny cottage garden, 
There was never an instruction within the grimoire as to how to locate them. This was left for Primrose to figure out, which he thoroughly reveled in. Feeling brighter for seeing the sunrise, before she set about her task, she took some time to make an offering to the land and the good folk, leaving some of the honey bread along with some of the lemon curd. She located a deep divot within one of the circle stones and poured some of the sweet lemonade within it. She smiled as she remembered hearing of cup-shaped depressions found in rocks in Sweden that bore carvings of sun wheels. These stone cups would hold offerings of milk that the Swedes would leave for the elves. Now that she had welcomed in the dawn and left her offerings, it was time to go in search of the rose. The rose is seen as one of the most symbolic of flowers. Hecate is referred to as the fiery rose within the Chaldean oracles. The Chaldean oracles are a group of spiritual and philosophical texts dating back to the 3rd to 6th century that many Neoplatonist philosophers used. The rose is said to stand for Hecate's dominion over nature. In Roman times, the rose was also associated with the dog, again connecting to Hecate. Romans who worshipped Hecate used the rose as a symbol of blood within funerary rites and also for their Rosalia festival, which celebrated the rose on various dates, primarily in May, but also scattered through mid-July. The wild rose that climbs is said to symbolise the space between worlds and times, often referred to as witch's briar. Places where the wild rose grow are said to be a liminal space where we can communicate with Hecate, her witches and other spirits. Roses were often used in ancient times for rites to honour the dead, to adorn statues of deities and in temples for rituals. In ancient times throughout the Western world, the rose was restricted to only be allowed to use in monasteries. Its spiritual properties are said to be for ancestral work, beginnings, calmness, psychic abilities, rebirth, sacredness within, health, love, beauty, divination and good luck. The rose represents female intuition and yin energy. It can be used as an astringent and it can be made into a tonic and ointment for inflammation. It can be used in magic through using dead flowers and fawns within banishing spells, for manifesting using fresh or dried petals, use the buds for new ventures and petals in love spells. You can also use rose petals in spells for protection, emotional healing and for building trust in yourself and others. As a psychic aid, it's best to use rose petals from wild or hedge roses. Having a wild rose bush is said to help in attracting the fae. The rose's planetary correspondence is Venus. Its elemental correspondence is water. Zodiac sign is Taurus, and it's said to be linked to the butterfly. To encourage prophetic dreams, you can make a soft infusion with rosebuds and drink it just before bedtime. Rose petals are most associated with properties such as kindness and passion. Rose hips are good for emotional healing spells. Rose buds are symbolic of new beginnings and new life, so good for spells for new projects. Fawns are good for banishing spells. Roses are great to use as offerings and can attune us to primal force. Recipe for rose water. Ideally use wild roses, however storeball are also fine as long as they haven't been treated with harsh pesticides. For this you will need a stainless steel pot with a lid, a colander, a large heat resistant bowl, wooden spoon, 
petals from six roses, drinking water, jam jars to store them in, and vodka or a neutral spirit. Remove the petals and give them a wash. Add the petals to your pot. Cover with water, ensuring the water is two inches higher than the petals. Bring to the boil slowly over a medium high heat and stir frequently. Remove from the heat, cover and leave to rest until cooled. Strain through your colander into your large heat proof bowl. You can add one tablespoon of vodka or a neutral spirit per two cups of water as a preservative. Blend gently, then transfer into your jam jars and store them in a dark, cool place. You can use the petals that you strained if you like. They will be packed full of nutrients and magical properties. You can spread your rose petals onto baking paper on a baking tray and dry in the oven at a low heat. You might wish to cast intentions over your jars of rose water, perhaps leaving them under the light of a full or new moon. Mugwort, Latin name Artemisia vulgaris. Other names are cronewood, common wormwood, St. John's plant, wild wormwood, dreamweed, artemis herb, nautman, sailor tobacco, old uncle henry, artemisia, mother of herbs. Its element is earth, it has a feminine energy, it is linked to the planets of venus but also the moon, zodiac signs, taurus, scorpio and libra, linked to Midsummer and Samhain. Using spell work for psychic ability, lucid dreaming, astral projection, dream magic, hedge riding, divination, protection magic, love spells, cleansing, prophecy, fertility, strength, healing, any magic linked to the moon, full moon rituals especially, and working to pull in the goddess energy. Mugwort is one of the most mysterious herbs in the botanical world due to its many supernatural properties. Throughout history, it's highly regarded as a powerful physical and metaphysical healer. Mugwort is a member of the Artemisia family, a group of plants named for the Greek goddess Artemis. Artemis is the goddess of the hunt, the wilderness, wild animals, the moon, a protector of women, fertility, creativity, witchcraft, psychic ability and chastity. It is said she used parts of the plants to make her arrows. Due to its association with Artemis, Mugwort was often used to aid in childbirth and relieve womanly problems, but also thought to cause hemorrhaging if used too often. Mugwort is deeply associated with Midsummer and St. John's Day, from which it derives many of its folk names. During midsummer celebrations in Germany, Mugwort was fashioned into a girdle to protect against bad luck which is sorcery and the evil eye. On the night of midsummer, the girdle was tossed into the fire to burn away all ill will and bad luck, particularly disease. It was also common to find mugwort hung in houses or placed in sheds on midsummer's eve to protect people and livestock from evil spirits, witches and the fae. This was especially common as a practice in England. A coal of mugwort, which likely refers to a dead or rotten root mass, was dug up at midnight on midsummer and used as a protection amulet for the rest of the year from a number of diseases. Across the way in France, mugwort was harvested and worn during midsummer to protect against aches and pains. 
On Midsummer's Eve, it is a good practice to bathe in mugwort prior to the shortest night and toss bunches of the wild herb into the bonfire to enjoy a year full of blessings. Burn as an incense at Samhain, it can assist with ancestor work. Make into sachets with protection charms placed upon them to support you with your travels, ensuring that you are protected. Add a pinch of mugwort to your divination tools to keep them enchanted, their aura strong and protected. Fill a sachet of mugwort and add to your drawers or wardrobe to repel moths. Keep a fresh sprig above your front door for protection and good fortune. Grow next to your home to bless and protect it. Apart from its use in midsummer celebrations, mugwort was generally used throughout the year for protection. It is one of the herbs featured in the Anglo-Saxon Nine Herbs Charm. Where mugwort is said to aid in protecting against illness, disease, and venom. As such, when carried on your person, it is thought to guard against harm by poison, wild beasts, or sunstroke. In Belgium, a potion of mugwort was given to those suspected of being bewitched, and a cross of mugwort was made for general protection. Sometimes these mugwort crosses were hung in barns and hen houses to protect milk and eggs from being spoiled by witches. Some folklore also suggests that a decoction of mugwort picked on midsummer was applied to the udders of cows, barely producing milk to remove witch curses. In Germany, mugwort was placed under the pillows of the sick to heal them and protect them from further illness. However, if the person could not sleep, it was an omen of death. Due to its general protective abilities, mugwort can be used in much the same manner today as it was used historically. Hang mugwort in the home to protect against negativity, bad luck, ill will, and to prevent unwanted guests from entering your home. Use it in protection spells and rituals, or create a wash to wipe down entryways and floors for the same purpose. It can also be burned to cleanse and protect your space. Apart from its use in protection magic, it was commonly used by travellers to increase stamina and prevent aches and pains. Roman soldiers placed mugwort in their shoes to protect their feet against fatigue. Scottish folklore also attributes mugwort to good health. In a folktale about a mermaid watching a funeral procession, the mermaid is quoted saying, if they eat nettles in March and drink mugwort in May, so many fine maidens would not go to clay. Both nettles and mugwort have natural healing abilities and are full of vital nutrients, so it comes as no surprise that such a combination was believed to prolong one's life. There is some folklore that suggests mugwort can be used in love spells. Widows were said to wear sprigs of mugwort to attract new love, while other folklore suggests young maidens placed sprigs between their breasts to attract a suitor. In ancient Greece, mugwort was used to gain love and friendship, sometimes being hung in the bedroom to ensure a happy marriage. Mugwort is deeply associated with dream magic and astral travel. It's a mild hallucinogenic when smoked or applied to the skin and can be used to induce an altered state of consciousness prior to astral travel or hedge riding. It's a common ingredient in modern flying ointments because of this and was used in historical flying ointments too. Add mugwort to smoke blends or smoke it on its own to help you ease into a trance or meditative state. Add it to your bath to assist with bringing on sleep and dreams. 
Used as a tea, mugwort relaxes the nerves and stimulates, opens and cleanses your third eye, which helps you to be more open to receiving messages from the other world. It stimulates dreams, helps you to fall asleep and with dream recall. Mugwort is said to protect you within the physical and metaphysical world. If you are at the next level of dreaming, cognitive dreaming, being aware one is dreaming and being able to manipulate the dream at will, mugwort can enhance this. No matter what level one is dreaming at, mugwort can help you to develop your abilities. But beware, for until you become proficient, your dreams may at first be difficult to deal with. You can burn it before you sleep for protection and dream enhancement. And it makes a good herb for clearing negativity away from your home. Use mugwort leaves for tea or to make a tincture. The leaves have a downward and warming action on the body that encourages digestion, eases gas and nausea. It also stimulates circulation to the uterus, which can help regulate the menstrual cycle and ease painful menstruation. It can also help with the onset of menopause. It's not recommended for use with women during pregnancy as it can induce labor. You can apply crushed mugwort leaves to your skin to relieve burning, itching and pain. Apply continuously to warts as it can help to get rid of them. Mugwool and honey applied is said to relieve bruises. It's a topical anaesthetic and it has antifungal and antibacterial properties. It's also an anticoagulant, anthelmintic, which means it can kill intestinal worms and parasites. It's antispasmodic, which means it suppresses muscle spasms, and it is carminative, which means it releases gas. According to law, chewing fresh mugwort leaves will help relieve tiredness, fatigue, and help to clear the mind. Mugwort can be used wherever a digestive stimulant is needed. It stimulates the appetite and it eases chronic stomach pains. When taken internally, it stimulates the production of bitter juices whilst also providing carminative oil. The volatile oil in mugwort, which contains cineal and thujone, has a mild nervine action that can aid in depression and easing tension. Children should not take mugwort As a rule of thumb, if you are not old enough to menstruate, you are not old enough to ingest mugwort. The best way to dry mugwort is to tie a string around small bundles of plants. Hang them somewhere dry, preferably dark, but not essential for a couple of weeks. Then crush it down and store within jars or bags. Leaves and roots can be harvested between July and September, To create an infusion, pour one cup of boiling water over one to two teaspoons of the dried herb and leave to infuse. Lavender and chamomile make nice accompaniments to mugwort as a tea. Mugwort is a bit bitter, so you may want to sweeten it with honey. Recipe for Artemisia Antiseptic. Fill a mason jar three quarters full with equal parts mugwort leaves and lavender flowers. Fresh is best, but dried is fine. Fill the jar up with apple cider vinegar and apply with cotton wool to affected areas. That is all I have for you today, witches. Thank you so much for joining me. I do obviously need to say if you are going to be working with mugwort, first off, if you are a child or pregnant, please don't do it. Other than that, please seek out further information. Make sure you can work with it medically. I'm not a herbalist. So yes, please just do your homework. I would just hate for anything to go wrong. 
Thank you so much for all your lovely reviews. I'm so grateful. They are so lovely to read, honestly. So if you ever can leave me a review, if you haven't already, I would be so grateful. It really, really helps the podcast. Podcast has gone through a huge growth spurt of late. So that's really helped me out and I appreciate you so much. I'm really excited. There are a lot of exciting authors and people coming onto the show, people that really resonate with me, honestly, people that I really think that you are really going to learn a lot from, myself included. There are lots of things that I want to ask them. So yes, there are a lot of exciting things coming up on the podcast in the forthcoming weeks. Aside from that... I will catch up with you all next week, which is have a great one. And I'm sending you lots and lots of witchy love. 